10 architects from 10 countries presented 40 schemes for the UN headquarters. Some people said, you know what, this is never going to work. There were fights, but that became part of the folklore. Gentlemen, it has been extremely difficult for us to reach a common agreement on this plan. Finally, they whittled it down to just two, the Brazilian Niemeyer's Scheme 23 versus the Frenchman Le Corbusier's Scheme 32. The New York dealmaker, Wally Harrison, knew if one side was made to feel like the loser, it could threaten the project. So he maneuvered to give a little something to everyone. Le Corbusier had wanted 60 stories. The first design called for 45 stories. In the end, they wound up with 30 stories. Reality sucks. The essence of the compromise was this. One narrow tower, 550 feet tall, oriented north-south, and a separate General Assembly building with a saddle roof built low along First Avenue. Between them, the central courtyard Le Corbusier insisted on for the delegates. All of his projects always have a place where you can get out of the buildings and walk around and give yourself an opportunity to rethink what you were discussing five minutes ago. With the international architects happy, Harrison moved to an issue that could turn every New Yorker against the project. How to bring all those foreign luminaries to Turtle Bay without tying the whole city in knots. Heads of state bring traffic congestion. Each head of state brings its own 20 cars of police and their own security and their own ministers. To free up First Avenue, they decided to dig under it. They decided upon a tunnel with a four-lane underground First Avenue from 41st Street to 49th Street. So you'd skip underneath the entire 42nd Street to 48th Street, UN, which made it very convenient to avoid traffic. It was a very clever thing to do. But First Avenue was only half the problem. On the other side, the lot was hemmed in by the FDR Drive. They needed more space. They ended up with a cantilever, which takes the surface of the ground floor and extends it out over the FDR drive. The laying of this cornerstone is an act of faith. We must make our devotion to the ideals of the Charter as strong as the steel in this building. Unfortunately, that steel wasn't as strong as President Truman was letting on. As the tower rose, the winds off the East River threatened to push, or rather, pull it down. When wind hits a building, the two little molecules of air next to each other have to decide which way to go to get around it. When they go around a tall structure, they have to accelerate. They are generating suctions and pressures at the corners of the building that are much higher loads than the normal wind load would be. Because of the thinness of this building, they decided they were going to use the strength of the stone and the steel to reinforce it. The steel plus stone made it strong, but glass would make it cutting edge. After all, the UN had to be more than just another skyscraper. It had to be a symbol, a counterpoint to the world's recent dark past. World War II had just ended. Everybody was sick and tired of that and all of the architectural monuments to fascism and everything else that came out of that. This was going to be a big deal for a big idea. At that time, Architects were experimenting with glass in a movement known as the international style. One, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, who'd fled Nazi Germany for America, had even dreamed of building tall with glass. It was sort of a vision, really. Ever since Mies proposed this building that was impossible to build with the technologies that they had at the time. Up to this point, the late 1940s, Steel frame skyscrapers had masonry curtain walls of limestone, brick, or granite. But Wallace Harrison knew the UN was a fitting project to try to build out of glass. It was an opportunity to portray a transparency of what was happening at the UN. They need to show off what happens inside, so they need to be clad with glass. Nobody knew if a glass curtain wall this size was possible, but they set to work. They were making a matrix that was understood in which they could install windows. They designed a prefabricated frame that spanned from floor to floor. 
so that when the building structure was up to a certain point, they could begin installing these empty frames and then install the glass and the sashes into those frames. The steel structure is inside the building and then the glass is the outer frame, which is just a curtain. It was a very clever solution to make a building more transparent. The unitized system was like a series of giant picture frames. Each one stood about 12 feet tall and four feet wide. The aluminum units were prefabricated and hung on the face of the building like curtains. The unit frames were delivered to site and then brought up on the construction hoist to every floor, and then from those floors they were hung out on the building, just as a new unit system curtain wall would be installed. Then they came along and installed the double-hung windows into those frames. But the folks behind the glass curtain were about to take a lot of heat. 